a total economic and financial war. That's how the French finance minister puts it. Western allies have hit Russia with a swath of economic sanctions over its invasion on Ukraine. We'll take a look at what effect they've been having and what their limits are. Also coming up, oil and gas prices have been galloping. Industry heavyweights like BP and Shell are divesting of multi-billion dollar projects in Russia. What will this conflict mean for Europe's energy security? We'll get an expert's view. And we'll go to Turkey, where people fear that clamping down on Russia's economy could push already high prices even further. I'm Chris Kober. Welcome to this special edition of DW Business, Russia, an economy at war. The international response to the Russian aggression has been swift and concerted. As of a broadcast, sanctions include Russia's exclusion from the international payment messaging service known as SWIFT, restrictions on Russian banks, asset freezes and travel bans, as well as barred access to high tech. The full extent of the damage Russia's war cannot yet be known, but Western powers are hoping inflicting economic pain will push President Putin to reverse his course. Economic sanctions are nothing new for Russia. And yet, most people here have no idea how big an impact the latest financial sanctions will have on their lives and their families. It's unclear. I can't even say much about it. Most people can't. As a businessman, I'm looking at the facts. I will likely have to work more. But what can you do? We'll have to live with this and just hang in there. It is what it is. No, the sanctions won't hurt us much. We are simple people and don't have much in terms of savings. It won't hurt us, but it will hurt the economy. As evidence on the financial markets, the ruble dropped dramatically this week. The key interest rate has been lifted from 9.5 to 20 percent. It's a drastic step for Russia's central bank, whose president is worried. The parameters for the Russian economy have changed fundamentally. The latest sanctions have led to a radical correction in foreign exchange rates. Also, our access to financial reserves has been restricted. We will need to use a wide variety of monetary tools to guarantee financial stability for our country. Analysts say the central bank's drastic measures are necessary, but they are also a risky bet. Raising the interest rate so drastically could be too much of a burden for many businesses. They might become insolvent. That could lead to higher unemployment and an economic crisis. The tense economic situation has Russian President Putin worried, too. He has called the Western bloc an empire of lies and has limited transactions from Russia into foreign countries. He has also ordered interest rates for personal loans to be kept stable. Meanwhile, one of the country's most influential oligarchs, Oleg Deripaska, has demanded an end to Russia's state capitalism. Other oligarchs, including Yevgeny Lebedev and Oleg Tinkov, have openly criticized the war against Ukraine. Putin is not used to such criticism from the business elite. This whole war scenario is a disaster for the entire economy and for people personally. In Russia, of course, the government isn't calling it a war, but a military special operation. For more, let's bring in Julia Graufogel. She's a senior research fellow at the German Institute for Global and Area Studies. Welcome to DW, Julia. Do you believe that sanctions will help stop this war? So sanctions usually pursue different goals. Um, and one is indeed to force uh, behavioral change. In that regard, I'm very skeptical because I feel that the current Russian response is chiefly influenced by the situation on the ground in Ukraine and also by the recent announcement of the EU to deliver weapons. But sanctions also pursue different goals. They signal that the Russian invasion of Ukraine was a blatant violation of international law 
And this signal has been very co coherent and very swift. And they also seem to constrain the regime financially and economically, which will have an impact on the Russian behavior in the mid to long term. Mm. The French finance minister says Western sanctions will bring about the collapse of the Russian economy. Is that likely? So a lot of the impacts of sanctions usually unfold over time. This, for instance, concerns the uh, ban on the export of um, technologies from the EU and the US to Russia. But we have seen some um, pretty um, swift, immediate consequences. Um, the ruble lost about a fourth of its value. Um, and we also see ordinary Russians queuing uh, to withdraw their money. Um, we will probably see a rise in inflation. So there's some really drastic economic consequences that Russia is facing at the moment. So how do you evaluate the impact of these sanctions um, that they have already been having? So I think they have, as I said, um, quite remarkable economic consequences also com compared to the sanctions that we saw um, in the context of the Crimea crisis. Um, but um, despite these remarkable economic and financial consequences for the Russian regime, um, I don't think they will force the Russian regime and Putin into any behavioral change in the short term, because sanctions and the armed conflict that is also unfolding have different time horizons. And the impact of sanctions is usually more midterm, whereas the current Russian response is really influenced by what's happening on the ground in Ukraine. Does that mean then that in this conflict, we basically need to wait out until a military, uh, let's call it solution or a military goal uh, is achieved? Not necessarily. There's even further measures in terms of sanctions that could be pursued. So um, the freeze of the Russian central bank assets is already remarkable. Um, and it seems that current measures um, target almost 80% of the Russian banking assets. Um, but the sanctions could be further expanded. So currently transactions, for instance, related to the export of Russian gas are not completely disabled by the SWIFT sanctions yet. So that would be a step um, to also further escalate the current sanctions. Um, so there's some potential and some further leverage for the EU in that regard as well. Well, that is something that Germany in particular is uh, shying away from uh, at the moment. Um, Julia, let me ask you, Western companies are pulling out of Russia. BP and Shell have abandoned multi-billion dollar deals. What will the toll of sanctions on Russia be for company in the EU and elsewhere? So it's um, impossible to, to implement such comprehensive sanctions like the ones that we currently observe on an economy like Russia without having um, also drastic repercussions for the German and the e European economy. Um, but we should not forget about the repercussions also for the Russian population. Um, so there will be certainly um, financial losses on both sides. Julia Garfogel of the German Institute for Global and Area Studies. Thank you. Thank you. Economic sanctions are taking their toll on both sides, albeit in different volumes. Now, among the more heavily affected in the EU are companies in eastern Germany. They see their traditionally close business ties with Russia under threat. The final test run. The wire being wound up here is for producing springs that close valves in industrial plants. The measurements must be precise and the surface has to be very smooth. This specialized machinery produced by the Chemnitz-based company Kieselstein can produce steel, copper and other wires. Such a machine costs up to a million euros and each one is custom built for buyers. This company is a market leader. But managing director Jens Kieselstein doesn't know whether he can keep all his 45 employees. Some top customers are in Russia, but the sanctions resulting from Russia's invasion of Ukraine complicate business. 
We're currently preparing a contract worth several million euros over the next two years. If the contract cannot be fulfilled according to the current terms, we will of course need or have to look for alternative customers. That will take time. It will lead to a cut in working hours and, in the worst-case scenario, to layoffs. The medium-sized company Kieselstein is not an isolated case. In the eastern German city of Chemnitz, formerly Karl Markstadt, many companies have long-standing business ties with Russia. Christoph Duberg, a foreign trade expert at the region's Chamber of Industry and Commerce, believes that hundreds of millions of euros in sales have already been lost here due to the sanctions following Russia's annexation of Crimea in 2014. Today, Putin's war could bring trade with many former Soviet republics, such as Georgia, to a standstill. Because Russia actually has a central distributor function, many companies have established a subsidiary in Moscow or in other Russian regions, especially in the metals processing sector. And from there, they were active in the surrounding regions. Company CEO Jens Kieselstein does not believe that the planned new sanctions will really hurt Russia, at least not as far as trade is concerned. We have Asian competitors there who then would just bridge a gap in the market, and that would lead to cuts in our business here. So others would just fill that gap. Jens Kieselstein is certain that the only complete exclusion of Russia from international payment systems can really put pressure on the autocrat Vladimir Putin. Now, when it comes to hitting Russia where it hurts, the oil and gas sector represents an outside target, although sanctions so far have largely spared this key industry. However, international energy giants are taking it upon themselves to review their business activities in Russia, with some packing it in altogether. Oil giant Shell is ending its cooperation with Gazprom in key oil and gas projects worth about $3 billion combined. Shell's decision follows a similar move by BP, which said it would abandon its nearly 20% stake in Russia's state-owned Rosneft, resulting in a hit of up to $25 billion. Meanwhile, in Germany, the government has officially slammed the brakes on Nord Stream 2, the undersea pipeline that was to take Russian gas through the Baltic Sea to Germany. The already controversial topic has become toxic, which also means those that had been banking on its operation need to readjust, like in Lubmin, in the northeast of Germany. No day is like any other here in Lubmin. What the mayor long feared would happen has now become a reality. Germany has put the certification process of the completed Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline on hold. En route to his office, Axel Folk drives past the pipeline, so close to going online, but now its future is unclear. On the one hand, we are concerned about this escalation in Ukraine. But on the other hand, the fruits of years of work are now in question when it comes to Nord Stream 2. The Nord Stream 1 and 2 landfall facilities are in Lubmin. The first pipeline has brought one and a half to two million euros of tax revenue annually into the resort's coffers the past 11 years. But now pro-Russian sentiment in Lubmin is crumbling. We believe that any forms of violence that violates international or state law or human rights is never acceptable. Diplomatic solutions must always be sought, and I strongly believe in that. 1,200 kilometers of natural gas pipeline through the Baltic Sea end here, a real dimension for such a small place. We were all really looking forward to it. Such a shame. Let's hope that reason will prevail and an agreement can still be reached. We shouldn't lose control. We can produce or develop our own things. There has to be a means of exerting pressure. But we've been misled. We have to pay the price. How much extra do we have to pay now? How expensive is natural gas? And how much will we have to pay for all this? 
The unpaid mayor is a lawyer by profession. He's come to the town hall to attend a meeting on the budget. As a precaution, he didn't include any revenue from Nord Stream 2 in the budget, and he no longer considers Nord Stream 1 a certainty. We will have to talk about whether we should postpone some projects or maybe reconsider or delay them so we can be sure that in the event that energy sanctions are imposed, we won't end up with a lack of money to finance our projects. Tiny Lumi now suddenly finds itself in the midst of saber-rattling between Moscow, Kyiv, Berlin and Washington. Let's take a closer look at what this means for Europe and its energy security with Karen Patel. She is a professor for economics and head of the IFO Center for Energy, Climate and Resources in Munich. Welcome uh, to DW, Karen. What if President Putin were to use energy as a weapon and cut gas supplies to Europe? I mean, in the in the short term, I don't think much would happen apart from rising prices. I mean, that is still a threat that is out there. But the longer, basically, he is delivering, he is um, exporting fossil fuels, especially gas, um, the less problematic the situation becomes because winter is progressing. The real problem would occur next winter because we would have to fill our reserves in the summer. We would feel the gap in the winter the entire winter, so that would be the real problem. Europe uh, and Germany in particular say um, energy sources need to be diversified away from Russian fossil fuels. How quickly is that possible? I mean, what is possible is to some extent to uh, increase the imports of LNG, although there is capacity limits with respect to those imports. There's currently only some limits uh, or some limits are not reached in the south of Europe. And then it's, of course, always uh, the option to refire up and to reuse more coal um, to potentially in Germany um, let the last remaining nuclear power plants uh, run longer, but the long run option really is to go for a faster expansion of uh, renewable energies and a decrease in demand through energy efficiency measures and the like. And which one do you think is more likely amid this situation of crisis right now? At the moment, um, like I said, everybody is mainly concerned about next winter. So the aim will be to actually fill up the gas tanks in the summer and to assure that, uh, for example, LNG, but also pipeline gas is a uh, route to Germany. So trying to get the contracts in advance. In the medium term, uh, it's going to be the renewables expansion um, combined with and that will be the good question because we were counting on natural gas. And so one option would really be that if Russia is not exporting in the long run, um, that gas prices, higher gas prices would actually ex lead to an expansion of the LNG capacities. And that is already happening. It might just mm. uh, increase in pace then. Uh, dealing but it comes with as a price. Uh, it dealing, comes as a price, of course. Karen, dealing with this, with this short-term demand that, that, that might have to be bridged um, when it comes to moving away from, from uh, Russian fossil fuels, where is uh, LNG, liquefied natural gas, going to come from? I mean, there is, of course, a number of sources, uh, Qatar among them, uh, the US, Australia. Um, so there is already a number of, or quite some LNG capacities out. There is just, so far, Asia is uh, importing the bulk of it and the capacities in Europe, in comparison, are relatively small. Uh, Karen, um as this conflict is nowhere from being resolved right now, and obviously um, there are uh, a lot of issues at, at, at stake here, um, outline for us your vision of how energy security uh, will, will be managed in the coming years. I mean, in the coming years, I would uh, say, OK, press the button on the renewables, because this has uh, been lagging in Germany, but that has been the aim all along for um, the last year. And then combine that with um, a more diversified and secure um, LNG, especially LNG input, that would require on the one hand, of course, for example, building new terminals in Germany, but also other locations, but also um, 
improve the connectivity within mm. Europe, within the gas grid, because so far, I mean, there's capacities free in Spain. It's just the question how to get it to the places where it's needed. Karen Patel of the IFO Center for Energy, Climate and Resources in Munich. Thank you for talking to us. Thank you. Russia is not only a major supplier of energy to the global market, it's also the world's largest exporter of wheat. And one of its most important customers is Turkey, a country that has been grappling with its own economic crisis. For months now, people in Turkey have been suffering from high inflation. And now many people fear already high prices could rise even further. The opposition is taking advantage of the bad mood. People in Istanbul can vent their anger on mobile posters. If you're not in line for gasoline, you're in line for subsidized bread, they say. Or give us back our youth. Inflation rose by almost 50% in January compared to the same month last year. More and more people fear for their livelihoods. What we used to buy for one lira now costs three liras. What we used to buy for 10 liras is 30 liras now. In other words, people can no longer afford to buy food and bread, let alone shopping and traveling. Food is so expensive because Turkey has to import a large part of its needs. Its most important supplier for grain is Russia. When we talk about relations with Russia, we usually think about weapons or energy. But much more significant is that Turkey is very dependent on the Russian agricultural market, especially for wheat, barley, soybeans, sunflowers, corn. We buy everything from Russia. Ukraine is also one of the world's largest wheat growers. Now there's fear that the pressure on prices will increase further due to Russia's ongoing invasion. And this at a time when many in Turkey can only afford state-subsidized bread. For more, let's go over to Istanbul and DW correspondent Julia Han, whose report you just saw. Julia, if the situation with Russia is so difficult and prices are likely to rise further, um, could Turkey get its grains from other suppliers? Well, Turkey's agriculture ministry recently said that it does not expect grain supply shortages due to the conflict and that it could turn to other sources. But if you look at the figures, Russia and Ukraine together account for nearly 80 percent of Turkey's wheat imports. And right now it's unclear if these two countries will and can continue to supply and at which cost, even if other global suppliers like Canada or the U.S. would step in, um, it's likely to get more expensive because of rising transportation and, and energy costs. Um, experts here in Turkey, economists, tell me that they do expect uh, further price hikes uh, for basic goods, especially for bread, but also for gas and oil. So uh, the consequences for Turkey's already ailing economy could be quite severe. Skyrocketing inflation has already caused a lot of anger and uh, despair. And now the war could actually add pressure to already existing problems. And Julia, Turkish President uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan is walking a thin line here. He's head of a NATO member country. At the same time, uh, Turkey and its economy are heavily dependent on its ties with Russia. Well, Turkish President Erdogan has developed close economic and political ties with both uh, Russia and Ukraine in recent years. And yes, that has put him in a delicate position where we see him now trying to balance uh, his commitments towards NATO ally Ukraine. Uh, Turkey sold combat drones to the Ukrainian government. Uh, they also announced new trade deals with, on the other hand, its uh, ties uh, to Moscow. Uh, now, uh, Turkey and Russia have a considerable trade volume worth nearly 35 billion US dollars last year. Turkey depends on Russian gas, on Russian tourists as well. Um, Russia has invested 20 billion US dollars in a nuclear power plant here in Turkey. So Erdogan can't afford a fallout with Russia economically. And I think that to a large extent explains his political balancing act. And Julia, reeling from the shock of massive economic losses due to the coronavirus uh, pandemic, Turkey was optimistic that its economy would bloom through its tourism sector this year. But now it's struggling under the Russia-Ukraine conflict. How? 
Well, no other country has been sending more tourists to Turkey than Russia. Nearly 5 million people last year. Ukraine actually ranks third with about 2 million people after uh, Germany. Turkey heavily relies on foreign currency inflows. But now uh, Turkish tourist, um, tourism associations and agencies are worried, are afraid that people won't come. Um, Ukrainians for obvious reasons. But uh, they also fear that uh, Russia's President Putin might announce another a travel ban for Russian tourists to Turkey or that um, payments due to the swift sanctions against uh, Russia, international payments um, have, are difficult or, or nearly mm. impossible. So the tourism industry uh, really fears great uh, losses. We are talking about several billion US dollars. There is a lot at stake for the Turkish tourism sector. DW correspondent Julia Hahn in Istanbul. Thank you. You've been watching a special edition of DW Business, Russia, an economy at war. The international response to Russia's aggression has been swift and concerted. Western powers are hoping inflicting economic pain via sanctions will push Vladimir Putin to reverse his course. That's all from me and the business team here in Berlin. Thanks for watching.